Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. <clears throat> May I without creating a big flap? Is that politically correct today? Uh, welcome to City Club, and our program today is uh, our guest speaker is uh, Susan Castillo, who is the State Superintendent of Public Instruction. She'll be talking about our Oregon schools making the grade, the state of public education, and if any of you had an opportunity to read the newspaper this morning, you'll know she's making headlines as well. Uh, I am Coraline Kraft. I'm the past president of the club. Both the, your president and um, president-elect were unable to be here today, so it's nice to see all of you again. If you would be kind enough to turn off your cell phones and other noise-making devices, I'm sure the speaker and your neighbors will be happy about that. Just a few brief announcements before we get to Ms. Castillo. Next Friday Forum on December 16th will be featuring uh, Ruth Gunther, who is the chief curator of the Art Museum, talking about the big picture, very cleverly entitled, the Portland Art Museum, Museum today. As you know, there's a change at the top of the Art Museum, so this is a very timely. He'll be interviewed by Tom Manley, who's a City Club member and the president of Pacific Northwest College of the Arts. I would also like to welcome a new member, Grant Yoshihara. Uh, are you here, Grant? Would you mind standing up so we can properly welcome you? Welcome. So he was wise enough to get a membership, and since we're speaking of that, I would like to remind you that City Club gift membership might be just exactly the ticket for uh, someone who is a little more difficult to buy for, maybe someone who's just beginning his or her career in Portland, or someone who's just retired and has uh, looking for an opportunity to have more input in civic engagement. Uh, Margaret Eichmann is at the back of the room, and she'll be happy to speak with you afterwards, and if you join today, you could save $25 for the new member's fee, which is a good incentive, I hope. And speaking of saving money, in fact, you can save $5 off the ticket price of the musical You're in Town when you attend the Sunday, December 11th matinee with the New Leaders Council. There's a pre-show social hour, trying saying that fast, pre show social hour with cast and artistic staff which begins at one and you can purchase directly uh, from the Stumptown Stages box office just tell them you're with the City Club and you can join the group and uh, get in on the discussion. And finally City Club's Education and Human Development Issues Committee will meet with Mayor Tom Potter at noon from noon to 1.15 on Tuesday December 13th in the Lovejoy room of the City Hall in a continued discussion of education for social justice. Should be very interesting. Details on all of these upcoming events and information about membership and other city club activities, including our blog, uh, can be found at www.pdxcityclub.org. So I invite you to go there. Uh, and please help me in thanking our sponsors for this quarter who make these programs possible. They are McEwen Giswold, LLP, and Medico Support Services of the Northwest Incorporated. Thank you, sponsors. <laughs> now on to our program. Oregon appears to have a somewhat ambivalent relationship with its public schools. In 1990, voters capped the local property tax funding for public schools and shifted the burden of funding to the state. But without new state revenue, the 1991 legislature adopted ambitious new performance standards for student achievement. Then in 2000, Oregon voters overwhelmingly approved a constitutional amendment requiring the governor and legislature to fund public education to meet the state's achievement goals. Yet the state maintains the 1990 tax structure that constrains stable revenue to meet those goals. And everyone knows, and our funding problems are very familiar, but the goals and how students are meeting them may not be so clear. Leading Oregon's strategy to boost student achievement is the state superintendent of public instruction, Susan Castillo. Susan was particularly motivated toward ensuring excellent education because as a third generation American, she grew up witnessing her mother's struggles to find employment with only an eighth grade education. She left a career as an award-winning television reporter in Eugene to become the first Hispanic woman to hold a seat in the Oregon legislature. 
In 2002, Susan was elected the Oregon State Superintendent of Public Instruction. And in this office, she's been focused on six priorities to improve education in Oregon. Making the education system more accountable, closing the achievement gap, literacy for all grades, improving middle and high schools, creating community schools, and making the Department of Education more efficient. And if you read the newspaper today, you'll see that she's proposing a rather, she is proposing a change that I think we'll all be anxious to hear about. Please join me in welcoming Susan Castillo. Thank you, Corleen, and thank you, Portland City Club, for this opportunity to talk with you all today about our children's future. I am as passionate about this state as all of you are, about uh, our beautiful mountains and our rocky coasts, our quirky cities, and our wide open spaces. But I have to tell you that there is no place, in my opinion, that captures Oregon's promise and potential quite like a schoolroom buzzing with activity. Just entering a school building, walking through the front door and down the hallway gets me excited and energized. And then getting to see great teachers do what they do. I tell you, nothing beats being in a classroom filled with young kids all fired up about learning trigonometry. Remember trig? Tangents? Anyone? Well, you hear a lot about tight budgets for public schools, but we here in Oregon are rich in a very important resource, and that is our teachers. Recently, I had the honor of giving the Oregon Teacher of the Year Award to Alan Bruner of Colton High School. Now, Colton's a small school, and so Alan keeps very busy teaching physics, chemistry, calculus, statistics, psychology, history, jazz, choir, and drama. I know, I get exhausted just uh, you know, reciting the subjects that he teaches. Can you imagine how he feels at the end of the day? But Alan amazes his colleagues and students with his energy and enthusiasm, and, and his principal says that he saves taxpayers money because it would take two or three of him to do what he does. Well, one student was quoted in the paper saying about him, whenever you think of one of those out there questions, you ask him, and he's the one who knows. I just love that. Well, today, I have some good news to share with you about the state of Oregon schools. And I can confidently say that we are on the right course. And I also want to talk about those areas where we still have a lot of work to do in public education in Oregon. And then finally, I have a challenge for all of you, but I'm going to save that for the last. Well, I want to start out by sharing with you some of the outstanding things that our students are accomplishing during what are truly trying times when school budgets are taking a beating and the critics of public education are shriller than ever, taking pot shots at our schools and our young people. And I have to say that they've got the story all wrong, and I'm gonna tell you why. Can't help but brag about our schools, so bear with me. Oregon school children are doing better than ever in the core areas, in reading and writing, math and science, and we know this because we are constantly measuring and tracking the progress of our students. Let's talk about results. This year, our students raised their scores in every core subject and in every grade tested. In August, when the Oregon Department of Education <clears throat> excuse me, released our yearly report cards evaluating every school in the state, this time around, more schools rated exceptional and strong than ever before. And that's not because we're getting easier, it's because our kids are getting smarter. We're seeing more schools across the state making significant improvement in those critical areas that most directly impact student achievement. Now a test we know can't measure all the learning that goes on in a classroom. That's one of the concerns I have about the No Child Left Behind Act. But I strongly support tough, thorough testing. You need to identify your strengths and your weaknesses. You need to know where you stand before you can set goals and go after them. And that's why it is so important that for the very first time, we are tracking how our districts are doing teaching our kids English. 
As Oregon becomes home to more and more children from Latin America, Asia, and Eastern Europe, we need to do the very best job we can teaching these children to read and write in English. It's a huge job with so much at stake because we know that teaching these children English will mean they will get the opportunity to live out the American dream. But in the past, we never knew for sure what kind of job that we've been doing in teaching these children, and now we do. We test them, and we take a good hard look at that data. So what have we found out? Well, we're not doing as well as we should be. We're using federal funds to boost teacher training, to get better textbooks and instructional materials in classrooms, and to work more closely with schools in Mexico to coordinate educational efforts for those children who move back and forth. And that's what I mean by knowing where you are so that you can see where you're going. By taking accountability seriously, all schools know they need to improve for all students. We start by establishing a challenging curriculum, then we study the numbers year by year to see how schools are faring and what strategies are working and what's not working. If something isn't working, we move on and try something else. And when something is working, we spread the word so others can benefit from that good work. I believe in a system of accountability that rewards success instead of punishing failure. We want results, and we want to help schools deliver that. But we will not, we cannot, accept mediocrity in any area and say we're doing good enough. We must push for excellence every day and with every child. Oregon's commitment to educational excellence begins at the very start of a child's schooling, in preschool and in kindergarten. Research tells us that those early years are a critical time when children develop into active, lifelong learners. By giving them an engaging and nurturing classroom experience when they're exposed to reading and math at an early age, they will develop a solid foundation for learning not just their ABCs, but real life skills like working together in teams and finding creative solutions to problems, being innovative thinkers. And this is why we have fundamentally revamped the Department of Education's approach to early childhood education to better coordinate school programs and services. And over the last three years, the number of students in full day kindergarten classes has jumped from 3,700 to 6,000, a significant increase. And now I'm challenging Oregon to offer full day kindergarten in every elementary school. And I'm challenging the Oregon legislature to work with me to find a way to fund it. <clears throat> I see that you agree with me that uh, every penny that we spend on kindergarten will be a worthwhile investment in the future as these children grow up, not only a benefit to them, but to all of us. We're also making gains across the educational spectrum. Today, Oregon teenagers are earning their diplomas and pursuing college in greater numbers than ever before. At the same time, we're increasing academic rigor, we're strengthening the curriculum and toughening diploma requirements so our graduates are ready for college or careers. And of course, you should also know that Oregonians post some of the highest SAT scores in the nation. However, high schools are one area where we're going to be making some big changes. Now you may remember the Oregon Education Act back in the 90s launched visionary reforms that reshaped public education in this state. Those changes, higher standards, better accountability, have worked well, especially at the primary and middle school levels. And I want to take a moment to recognize the leadership that Norma Paulus and Vera Katz provided this state when they set us on a new course for our students and put us on the map as national leaders in education. Let's give them a round of applause. I also want to recognize one of my predecessors, Vern Duncan, is with us today too, and Vern has also provided strong leadership in education for Oregon and also was a part of this work. <laughs> As we sit here, though, in 2005, 
We know it's time to celebrate and recognize the solid education foundation that we have built in those reform efforts, and to also recognize what remains a challenge and that needs to be changed. And I'm here to tell you now that I believe the time has come to move beyond SIM and CAM. And I'm not talking about abandoning what those certificates have been about, which is high standards, strong accountability for student performance, and creating a relevant learning experience that connects students with the workplace and the community. I want to make it clear that I'm not talking about taking a step back or lowering standards or expectations. It's about creating new clarity about what we want our students to know and be able to do to set them up for success in college, work, or citizenship in this 21st century global economy. We've heard from educators that the certificate system in SIM and CAM was too complex and confusing and that it was delivered from the top down with little input from schools. Some schools have embraced SIMCAM, which were created in addition to the high school diploma. But across Oregon today, fewer than a third of high school graduates earn a SIM after all of these years of implementation. The certificates have never been requirements for graduation, and that has led many students to ask, why then do they even matter? I can't tell you how many times students have asked me that question. Students have said if they are so important, they should have been made to be requirements. I believe the time has come to turn the page. As Oregonians, we can't be anchored to ac acronyms that no longer fit for the future or who have confused our students about what we expect them to know and be able to do. The world comes, moves fast and the future demands a different, a more ambitious approach to high school education. The State Board of Education has launched an extensive review of high school graduation requirements, of our standards, of our assessments, and the credentials. Because Sim and Cam have been about reaching high standards of achievement and making learning more relevant, we want to hang on to the parts of those efforts that have been helpful to students. It is very important that we have clear and measurable standards that tell us if our students are achieving the goals that we have established as a state, and that we provide information to parents, to schools, and to districts that help focus on improvement. So my goal in working with the State Board is that we're going to take everything we've learned, what works and what doesn't, and build a system that works better for everyone and lifts student achievement. Now where all of this discussion and debate, and there will be debate, will lead, I can't say today, but I firmly believe that when we complete this work, we will have a better, more rigorous, more relevant system for student achievement. And I want to take a moment for all of us to applaud those districts and schools that have embraced SIM and CAM over these years and have created nationally recognized educational experiences for their students. And we will be looking to your good work to move us to the next level. Let's give them a hand. Now I want to turn to a subject that is very close to my heart. I am proud to stand here and tell you today that Oregon is starting to close the achievement gap that holds back our low-income and minority students. So when I talk about how our state test scores are going up, I mean that they are also going up for every single major demographic group. And they are rising especially fast for our Hispanic, African American, and Native American students, as well as for economically disadvantaged students and students with disabilities. To celebrate schools that are distinguishing themselves and closing the achievement gap, we've started the Celebrating Student Success Conference. We hold it every spring, and last year, earlier this year, we drew 500 people from all across this diverse state to swap stories and share strategies for boosting student academic achievement. They came from NISA, 
from Beaverton, from White City, and from my hometown of Eugene. The event keeps growing every year, and this next year we will be inviting more parents to take part in workshops so they, so they can get the skills and training to better serve their schools as volunteers. I want to tell you uh, about one of our student success stories, Vernon Elementary School right here in Portland. Not long ago, Vernon was in disarray. Children weren't learning, test scores were dismal, teacher morale was in the dumps, Vernon's problems seemed unfixable. Then the Vernon community rallied together and faced with a mandate for change, teachers made reading the core of a revamped curriculum. They pored over assessment data to determine where they need to put extra focus and resources. They rewrote the discipline policy so that every classroom had the same rules and consequences. Vernon worked as a team. Educators, parents, community members with a single-minded goal of raising student achievement for their kids. Then something marvelous happened. Vernon blossomed. It took a few years, but today, four out of five students meet or exceed the state benchmarks in reading and math. Vernon recently earned an exceptional rating on its report card, and that's up from strong a year ago. So I tell you, the naysayers would have sworn it was impossible. So now it's my pleasure and honor to introduce to you the principal of Vernon Elementary, Joan Miller. She's going to say a few words. Thank you, and I'd like to thank Superintendent Castillo for giving me this opportunity to talk about my school, which I love to do. And I, I also would like to give an update, um, because at the time we were chosen for the award last year, four out of five students were meeting the benchmarks, and subsequently in our assessments last spring, we actually went up to over 90% in both reading and mathematics. <laughs> <clears throat> But it is true that nine years ago, Vernon was labeled a school in crisis, and there were some very good reasons for it. There were frequent disruptions to learning. Uh, teachers were all trying their own different strategies for teaching. And there was a lot of turnover as teachers moved on to other schools. So not surprisingly, at that point, our student achievement was below 20%. Um, so the staff decided to take some action and do something about it. They adopted a school reform program called Success for All that we refer to as SFA. SFA gave us a focus, which was literacy. So at Vernon today, every student spends 90 minutes each day in a reading class. We use research-based um, best practices for reading instruction, and then we frequently monitor the students and provide intervention when students are falling behind. Um, SFA has also given us guidance on how to work on attendance, to how to improve our discipline, and how to work with families and students when students are struggling. But the important thing to know is that there is no magic formula for closing the achievement gap, and it certainly doesn't happen overnight. It takes persistence and focus. Although the SFA program has been the vehicle for growth at Vernon, it's not a magic cure for it by itself either. What it really takes, the keys to success we have found has been high expectations, a unified, consistent approach across the school, and lots of teamwork. The path that we're on now has been a collaboration between staff, parents, our community partners, and of course, our wonderful students. And the other thing I wanted to say today is that while we're very pleased with the success our students have had on these achievement tests, we know that multiple choice tests don't measure all of the learning that takes place at Vernon. It's important to keep that in mind. We really value the arts and writing and creati uh, critical thinking, problem solving. We know how health and wellness are important to our students. And these are areas that aren't as easy to measure as uh, those things that are measured on standardized tests, but it doesn't mean they aren't important to us. And those are areas that we're really focusing on our improvement at this point. So I'd like to welcome anyone to come and visit us at Vernon School in Northeast Portland. If you do, you'll see that excitement in the hallways that Superintendent Castillo was talking about earlier. And you will also see how we put into action the motto that our school has, which is every day, every child a success. 
Thank you. Well, thank you, Joan. It's an inspiring story, and we have many inspiring stories all over Oregon today, and I hope you know that. We have been hammering away for years about focusing on academic fundamentals, on reading, writing, and math, and so you have, I've told you about those results. We should be focused on those areas, and we are making uh, tremendous uh, gains there. And I want to follow up on the comments that Joan just made, um, because too often, faced with budget cuts, our schools are being forced to cut programs like art and music and PE, and it is a disgrace that we have four schools to have to make those choices. But that is what's happening across the state of Oregon. And if we're gonna look at every single child as a unique, amazing learner, we cannot sacrifice the value that art and music and physical wellness offer our children. The arts are critical elements of a complete education, enhancing learning in those core areas that we all care so much about, like reading and math. And the same goes for physical education. In a time when this country faces an obesity epidemic, we need to make health a top priority for young people. But when schools are offering as little as 20 minutes of PE a week to children, we're giving them a sluggish start to what should be a healthy, active future. I'm working with volunteers, community groups, and local governments to find new and creative ways to ensure that all children get quality art and music. And if we value having a healthy society, all of us will need to find a way to get quality physical education in our schools for our kids every day. Now let's talk a bit about money because I know that that's an issue that we're all concerned about. And I've mentioned some initiatives that will cost money. I'm a big believer in accountability for academic achievement, and I believe just as strongly in accountability for how we spend our money, too. We received $5.24 billion uh, from Salem, from the Oregon legislature. Sounds like a lot, and it is, but it doesn't begin to make up for the years of cuts to teachers and programs. We may be doing better than ever in our core subject areas, but we certainly are not better off financially in our public schools. Yet I have to believe that in some ways, we are stronger for the hard times that we've had to endure. We have had to change the way that we do business in our schools. And let me tell you, there is innovation across Oregon as I visit school districts on how people are retargeting resources, trying to find new ways that they can be more efficient to get more dollars into the classroom with the challenges that they currently face. At the Oregon Department of Education, we're tightening the reins. We've already netted more than $2 million in savings and efficiencies. We're also looking closely at alternative programs and streamlining state policies so that districts don't have to cut through a tangle of bureaucratic tape to get things done. We have a ways to go there to, to uh, move forward on that, but we're working on it. I'm working with the Secretary of State and the Chalkboard Project to pursue more performance and financial audits of school districts around the state. All of this in an effort to make school spending truly transparent so that every taxpayer can see their dollars are being put to good use. And I'm urging state lawmakers to aggressively investigate problems whenever they arise, whether those problems are in a local school district or an education service district. We've had too many questions come up lately that tell me we may need to take a much closer look. Still, I can tell you firsthand that Oregon is being smarter about how we target our education dollars, and I need you, the public, to understand that we mean it. If we all want to get children off to a good start as kindergartners, if we want to see all children, regardless of the color of their skin or the language they speak at home or how much money their parents make, get a chance to excel, if we want to see well-rounded young citizens graduating ready to go to college or to careers, then we must be ready and willing to fight for a way to pay for it. You know, everybody wants to invest in a winner. And we have a winner right here in Oregon's public education system but we can no longer afford to starve our schools. 
And I've told you about some of our impressive accomplishments during a time when our budgets have been hammered. Imagine how much more we could do if we just raised Oregon's per student spending up to the national average. That increase would make a huge difference. But I'm not here just to talk about the case for more funding for our schools. I'm also here to ask for something that can't be tracked on a spreadsheet. Your hearts and your minds. We all have a lot of work to do to build a public education system that is the pride and joy of all Oregonians in the 21st century. Now usually in folks in my position are up here making promises to you. Today I'm going to ask you to make a promise. If you have young children in school, spend more time reading with them to help them with homework. Pick a day, and I don't mean the regularly scheduled day when you're supposed to meet with a teacher, to pay a visit to your child's classroom. Maybe bring an apple for the teacher. Better yet, volunteer or join the PTA, but get involved. And if you don't have children or your children are grown, you still have a responsibility to help out the younger generation. And I know people are busy juggling a lot these days. I know it's tough to find the time. You know, I've found in my travels to schools that the very best teachers are the ones who don't make excuses for their students. They expect them all to do excellent work. So I'm going to take a page from them. And I'm not, I'm not accepting any excuses from the grown-ups about not getting involved. I don't need to remind the people in this room, I know, how vital community service is to nurturing and sustaining our quality of life and to building a better future for the next generation of Oregonians. We're doing our part at the state by developing policies that will make it easier for communities to get more involved in their schools and I'm calling on Oregon business leaders and employers to offer flex time so workers can get the time to volunteer in local schools. But go even further get your company to adopt a school as a volunteering project for your employees. It will make a difference, believe me. And I want to share a story with you so you'll know what I'm talking about. Umpqua Bank, the branch in Eugene, adopted Kelly Middle School. For one year, 18 bankers from Umpqua went to the school for one hour each Wednesday and did reading intervention with struggling students. The result? a 20% increase in comprehension, and a 22% increase in fluency in a single year. And in addition to that, I was present when Umqua got an award for this wonderful work they did. The students so appreciated that these busy professionals cared enough about them to show up every week for a year to help them and cared about their progress. And the bankers say they got a lot out of it too. So make a difference in a child's life. Every bit of time and energy that you give matters. Volunteer an hour a week through the Smart Reading Program. It's a wonderful program that helps our children with reading. Coach basketball or soccer after school. Speak at a career day about what you do. Our students love hearing about what you do. Organize a playground cleanup. Go crazy and run for the school board. <laughs> but get involved. Get a stake in the future. And once you get into these schools and you see for yourself what's going on, you too will feel the electricity that I get to feel every time I visit a school. You will be in awe of what you see and hear and experience. And when you go home, you'll go out and you'll spread the word to your family and friends. You'll want to tell other people about what you're seeing our schools do today. And like me, You'll find yourself reinvigorated by your connection with young people in our schools. And if you aren't already, you'll become a believer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I can echo that. I had the privilege of being principal for a day at one of the schools this spring. And if you want your heart to lift, go sit in a classroom of six-year-olds, about five or six six-year-olds who are learning English as a second language. You'll never be the same. So I urge everybody to get involved. I could not more heartily agree. It comes time now for our question and answer period, which uh, is a privilege for City Club members only. 
And I know that all of you are smart enough to be able to phrase your questions within 30 seconds. And questions is the operative word, it is not a debate. Um, our first question will be asked by Chip Lazenby, who is a member of the Board of Governors, and he's an attorney with the Portland law firm of Bullivant Hauser Bailey. Chip holds an undergraduate degree from Harvard University and a law and MBA degrees from the University of Oregon. And he served for seven years as assistant county counsel for Multnomah County and later served as general legal counsel to Governor John Kitzhaber from 1995 through 2001 and he was general counsel at the Portland Development Commission until joining the Bullivant firm in May of 05. Chip. Um, as the Oregonian uh, noted this morning, you are moving away, and you noted in your remarks, you're moving away slightly from uh, Sim and Cam, in fact, moving a bit away from it. And your remarks also touched on something that all of us have experienced and you and I experienced together in Salem, which are the budget cuts and the constraints that uh, the state budget has. Um, in your mind, do you think that Sim and Cam could have been more successful if it had been adequately or fully funded over the time that uh, it was in full force? That is a great question. Absolutely, yes. Uh, in fact, it was such a struggle that I, I believe uh, in those early years, much of the work happened as a result of grants. Uh, I know uh, Norma Paulus was just, um, you know, so committed to the work and really was trying to help figure out how we would get some more uh, funding for our schools to help them with the professional development and the work in, uh, and, and to get the help that our schools needed to try to move forward on this. So it began really with trying to, you know, put together the, the money that we did have in the system, but also reaching out and getting some grant funds to get us started. So, yes, and that has been an issue all along that um, I know for a lot of our schools uh, feeling that a new mandate came along with no funding attached to it and um, having to uh, step up and make these changes without the adequate support. They felt they weren't adequately supported to move forward. So it has been a struggle all along and, and certainly had we had the resources, uh, more resources, I think we probably would have made more progress than we have. Chris Allman, City Club member. Um, 2014, that's our timeline. And um, I know you think that we're on course to meeting that timeline. And my, my questions are surrounding high stake testing. Um, a gentleman named Greg Kingsbury, who is uh, director of Northwest Educational Evaluation Association and uh, does testing in 1,500 school districts, came out in a New York Times art uh, article recently talking about NAEP testing, how um, school districts and schools throughout the nation, the, the results of those are not in sync with the progress that is um, being seen and reported. And as a member of a site council, a couple site councils, it's been concerning to me that in the past couple years, our state has been um, allowing students to take tests upwards of three times. When we're talking about that opportunity, it creates an apples and orange phenomenon in terms of knowing whether there are true learning gains. How can you reassure us that these results that we're seeing are showing true improvement in learning? Well, that's a good question. Are you talking, can I just ask a clarification? Are you talking about when students take, uh, uh, through TESSA, that they're able to take the test multiple exactly. times? Yeah. Um, we actually feel that that's a benefit for our students and we know that our students like the fact that they can do that because um, it really shows them immediately um, how they are doing and they get, it, it really um, inspires them and connects with them in a way that um, helps to, um, first of all, give them immediate feedback on where they are, what they still need to know and be able to do, and, um, and then they can be more targeted and take more ownership of their own learning on what it is they need to improve on, working with their teacher. So we find that, that students really actually benefit from us allowing them to do that. Um, we believe, you know, we're always looking at our assessment system 
asking, um, you know, where does it need improvement? How can we make it better? Are we getting a true measure of where our students are? We really have an assessment system that um, is very highly regarded around this country as, we're, as all states now have assessment systems in place um, as a result of No Child Left Behind. We were one of the leading states in the country developing testing and the federal government looked to Oregon as one of the leaders in the country when that law was being implemented. We have a lot of confidence in the system we currently have. That's not to say it's perfect and we are constantly taking a look at it and how we can improve it. And right now, our State Board of Education is doing just that right now in a very comprehensive way and asking and engaged in a dialogue with people inside the education system and outside the education system about that. And as we're now looking at this new opportunity from the federal government to uh, go after a growth model which would help us have a more fair and accurate way of measuring student success and we're looking at the possibility of, of being able to do that and what, you know, what the parameters are that the federal government is setting, um, we believe that that's even going to really take us further if that is something that we are able to pursue in helping us really improve how we do measure student performance and student learning. It is an incredibly exciting time right now in education as all all of us across the country are learning more and more about how you do get better measurements of how our students are learning and using data to inform how you um, um, uh, um, adjust your instruction and curriculum to meet the needs of every single student. So it is an incredibly exciting time, as I said, and lots of changes, lot of, lots of great thinkers in Oregon and across this country who are very much focused on that. Xander Patterson, City Club member. Oh, many of us in Portland feel like our school system has been suffering the death of a thousand cuts over many years. Um, yet you paint really quite a rosy picture of uh, progress in our schools. Uh, do we need more funding? And if so, how do you convince the, those who are skeptical that we need more funding and who are not very willing to pay more taxes that we do. What's the powerful argument that we need more funding for our schools? Yes, thank you for the question. You do have a lot to celebrate here in the Portland School District. Um, certainly, the, the last round of test data shows us that you are, you know, students are making progress and you are making progress on closing the achievement gap. Are you where you want to be? No, there's still a lot of work for all of us to do in the education system to help all of our students get to the levels of achievement we want them to be. But you're definitely headed in the right direction. What we have been doing, um, one of the, let me tell you about one of the initiatives we've been involved in that is so essential to our schools, districts being successful, and that is leadership and leadership development. We've been involved with a grant with the Wallace Foundation for several years now, and research is showing us that leadership is incredibly important to the outcomes for students. And right now in the, or in the, in the Portland School District, you have wonderful leadership. Your superintendent is just setting a wonderful course for students and for this community and you have a school board that is everybody it seems to me and from my perspective is focused right where they need to be on student achievement and bringing everybody together in a very focused way on how you're going to get the results that you want for your kids in this district. You have great leadership, you have a plan, you have um, you know people working together uh, and, um, and I think um, the missing piece of it is having the resources um, to, to help us get to where we want to go in the timeline we want. I don't ever want to hear anybody in education use resources an, as an excuse for us not making progress with students. That is absolutely not the way we need to talk about this. But we do need to say that resources are an important part of the picture to help us get to where we want to be. I was in a conversation with an architect the other day, and our state board was sharing this story as well the other day. He said, you know, I'm a designer, and when I have a design there, one of the important elements of the design is that it's going to be funded so that I can execute my design and, and what I plan to do as an architect. If you don't have that piece there, I know that my design and my plan is not going to move forward the way that I've, I've set it out to move. And I think that that is an important piece that we have not resolved in our state, and it is a very important challenge for all of us to continue to work on together. Yes, we do need more resources and investments in our, in our public schools, and we need to be working together on a statewide solution. I'm not making a statement there that I don't support local measures as well, 
but I think our state, it's, um, you know, right now we have people talking about filing a lawsuit against the state because of inadequate funding. I'm surprised we haven't had one up to now. Uh, and so um, it is a very serious issue, but on the other side of it, we are more focused, I think, than we've ever been on using data and helping us move forward on creating success for kids in our schools like we never have been before. We have more and better data than we've ever had before. And so we're all working together on how we do our work differently and, um, and move forward um, to help all kids be successful. And it's gonna take, until we get this figured out, or even, even when we do get it all figured out financially, we need everybody to be engaged on helping us. It's not just something the schools can accomplish on our own. We need partners to help us with getting the job done for all kids. And we have a lot of partners stepping up, you know, uh, all over Oregon. But we really all need to be doing it in a, in a more coordinated way to help all kids be successful. Steve Novick, City Club member. First of all, Susan, since the legislature did make the pair of the state fruit, I think that's what you should be encouraging parents to take to teachers. <laughs> but my question is, the new Bill Sizemore, a guy named Russ Walker, the head of the Oregon branch of the National Group Freedom Works, says he's planning to introduce an initiative next year to save the schools by forcing them to spend 65% of their money in the classroom, quote unquote. And I'd like to hear your opinion on that proposal. <laughs> Yeah, I have concerns about that because, first of all, I think that the, uh, it's my understanding that the definition of what's in the classroom is very, very narrow, and positions like librarians or counselors would not be a part of, what would that, of that definition. We know there are lots of other uh, components of an education system that are crucial to what happens in the classroom, and so that would be, that's my concern. Another concern is that it perpetuates a myth that's out there. A recent poll showed us that about 34% of Oregonians, uh, or, or, or that a lot of Oregonians think that about 34% um, of our education spending is on administration, when actually um, it's, it's about seven, eight percent, maybe less than seven percent goes into administration in our system. So there are a lot of um, misconceptions now about how the funding breaks down for education and, a, and an initiative like that only serves to, you know, perpetuate that and really ends up, um, uh, you know, leaving people with um, really inaccurate information about what we're doing with spending in our system. So I, I'm very concerned about that one. Thank you for the question. Uh, Bruce Pearson, City Club member. Um, so you've talked a lot about every single child getting the help they need and making a lot of advances. And yet, um, with conversations with a number, number of educators, I'm not a teacher myself, by the way, just so I'm clear about that. Um, I, a, a lot of teachers seem to address the idea that t schools are almost adopting kind of a, tri a triage policy. Um, there's going to be a number of students in every single class who are going to be able to pass the test successfully and they don't need extra help. There'll be another whole group of students that will be able to pass if they do get the special help and yet there's another whole group of students at the bottom who probably are not going to be able to help and the schools do not have the resources available to give these students at the lower end the help they need to pass the test and therefore they get to be almost a forgotten group at the bottom that do not get the help even though everybody recognizes they're the ones who need the help the most. And I guess I'd just like you to comment on that and see if that is a problem that uh, people are aware of or if it's legitimate. Well, meeting the needs of every single child is a challenge for our schools, especially today. But you just heard the story about what Vernon Elementary is doing. They have uh, you know, a population of students that maybe some people would look at and say, oh, there's no way you're going to get all those kids to high levels of achievement. One of the key elements of success for our schools is that everybody in that school believes that every single one of those, ch those children can reach high levels of achievement, no matter what challenges they walk in the door with. They don't make excuses for their kids. They say it's our responsibility to get them there, and they do whatever it takes, and they have strong leaders, as you heard from earlier, who say, I'm going to do whatever it takes and reach out to the community and partner with people because my kids, cannot, I cannot let a single one of these kids not make it. And they, and they are adamant and, and have the passion and, and drive to get that done. Strong leadership and the belief in every single child. We have examples of that happening 
all over Oregon. And that's why I believe it's so important that we, we recognize those schools, hold them up and celebrate them and learn from them. Exam you know, we, we've been studying the data. We look into, I told you we have more and better data than we've ever had in Oregon. So we're looking at it. What are these schools doing that are able to raise the achievement? achievement for all of their children, what do they do? And we see the common traits there, and it's focus, it's commitment and belief that they can all get there, and it's strong leadership, um, you know, making sure that they support their teachers, and their teachers are getting the support and the training that they need to get the job and to be successful, get the job done and be successful with all children. And so it is happening. Is it hard work? Absolutely. It is very, very hard work. But boy, there is nothing more important for us to be focused on today in Oregon. And so it is really important, and I believe at the Department of Education that it is our responsibility to step up and provide more leadership on helping to connect these best practices across our state and bringing people together who are, who are realizing a wonderful success with their children and helping that happen you know, everywhere. And as a result of calling out these schools, I already know that there are schools traveling to visit some of these highly successful schools that we're identifying. Other districts are sending teams of teachers there to visit and watch what they're doing and then bring those practices back into their school and in their district. And we need to be doing more of that. Yes. Fred Mathis, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a member, and I'm a member, and I'm a retired academic pediatrician uh, with an interest in early childhood development. I had the privilege a few years ago of spending time in Eastern Europe, where the children begin school at age seven. They want to go to school over here for college. So they take the SATs, and their scores exceed those of our students in math and science, not in reading and not in writing. Now, there's a great focus on early childhood education. Uh, my work has taught me that many of those children are not really ready for school. Uh, what drives the focus on the early childhood when in Eastern Europe and China and Russia, they make it work starting at age seven? Great question. Well, I was actually just in China in September and did visit a preschool there. Uh, and uh, we went to see some amazing work that students are doing in China and especially in the areas of math and science. We do have some work to do to strengthen uh, the performance of our students in math and science, and that is the focus of the work that uh, we are, that is where we are focused today in Oregon and actually across this country. There is a great concern on a national level about the need for us to raise the achievement level and the skill level of our students in those areas. Um, I'll tell you, in the conversations with the Chinese, we're, you know, we're all looking at what they're doing and producing these high levels of achievement in the math and sciences. And what's interesting, when you're engaged in a conversation with the education officials and ministry there, they say to us, yeah, but in your system, you produce students who are innovative, creative thinkers, and we need that. They know creative thinkers are going to be ruling the day in the 21st century, and that that is the skill that's going to be so essential in this 21st century. And so they're looking at our system and seeing and asking, how do you produce that? Uh, and so they're kind of, they're trying to move in that direction a little bit more in their system. And as, as we're looking at them on what they're doing on the math and sciences, it was a great visit and great exchange of information. On the early learning piece of it, there has been more research now that there is no doubt, I don't think, in, in anybody who's really looking at this and studying it, that if we make sure that we're taking care of children early on and setting them up to be ready to learn when they get to the first grade, that we are really going to set them on a course of success in school. And we know that we have had too many children who start school who aren't prepared for learning when they get to first grade. And that is why there's more and more research and evidence that um, we need to help ch more children get into preschool, especially children who have lots of challenges in their life and, and perhaps haven't, don't have good um, um, 
uh, literacy skills yet or um, you know, um, oral skills, uh, communication skills, and uh, trying to help them get what they need early on to prepare them for learning. We have now for years heard from educators and child development specialists about the need for us to invest early in children to set them up for success. Well now, I love this, we're now hearing economists and bank representatives tell us that it is one of the best places to put economic development dollars because when we invest in children and set them up for success, all of us in society benefit down the road from not having to invest in um, you know, crime prevention uh, efforts or um, we know that kids who are successful in school are less likely to become teen parents or to get in trouble with the law or, ha or with drug and alcohol abuse. We can just um, eliminate so many problems in our society if we invest in children early. And, and it is not just now just the right thing to do, it's now, there's now more and more evidence that it is the economically development smart thing to do, uh, and, um, and there is just a very strong connection there. So we have to do it throughout the spectrum. You know, it's addressing it early, starting children out strong, and then helping them get set up for whatever they're going to do when they leave the K through 12 system, whether it's going on to further education or the workplace, help them get set up to be contributing citizens in our, in our society and giving them those 21st century skills to help them in this, in this new century. Guinevere Milius, City Club member, um, it's known that Portland sends more money to the state than they get back for their schools, and um, that that may be in, in fact be fair. Portland is bigger and um, you know has more resources to support on the state level. However, there is a, a discussion going on in Portland and that went on at the legislature in the last session about whether or not it's fair to assign the same amount of money to an urban child as to a child in a rural district, and um, whether or not urban schools are in fact getting adequate funding to, to educate urban children. Is it true that it's more expensive to educate a child in an urban setting, and if so, what should be done about it? Well, <clears throat> this is really, you know, a really, a really good question. If you, talk to if you talk to people who are in the rural parts of our state, they'll tell you that they don't have enough money to do what they need to do and that they, need, they will want, want us to open up the uh, school funding formula and put more money into the uh, rural parts of the state, into rural districts. Uh, you, bring up, you bring up, you know, a very, very important point, and that is that the metro area subsidizes the rest of the state. This is where most of the income tax dollars come from into the state coffers, and then those income tax dollars is how we pay for our schools and for other state services. And so, um, and then, you know, it gets divided up with the rest of the state. And I know that it's very difficult for people who live in the metro area to look at your state budgets knowing that you don't have enough or, you know, as you're looking at, looking at the t tough choices you have to make because of what's happening with your budgets, knowing that some of the money that is generated here is going out to the rest of the state and supporting the rest of the state. And yet, when I go out to rural parts of Oregon, they tell me they would love to have the formula reopened so that they can get, because they need more funding in their part of the state, that their schools are not adequately funded either. So it is a system-wide challenge, and we need, a, we need a, a statewide challenge, and we need a statewide solution. Sorry, we are out of time, and so thank you so much, okay. Superintendent Castillo, for a lot of good information. <laughs> for those of you who would like to continue this discussion, please go to our blog at www.pdx.com, and let's just keep it going. It's a good place for yours, Chris. Thank you, and we're adjourned.